Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Dodie Bellamy and Megan Milk's new books, Bereaved and Slug and Other Stories, respectively, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after over 94 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and the time of authors like Megan and Dodie, we wouldn't be here today. And we are truly so appreciative of all of you. And so tonight we are thrilled to have with us Dodie Bellamy and Megan Milks for the launch of their books, Bereaved and Slug and Other Stories. Dodie Bellamy's writing focuses on sexuality, politics, and narrative experimentation, challenging the distinctions between fiction, the essay, and poetry. In 2018 through 2019, she was the subject of On Our Mind, a year-long series of public events, commissioned essays, and reading group meetings organized by the CAA Wattis Institute. In October 2021, Semiotex will publish Bereaved, an uh, essay memoir collection circling around grief, loss, and abandonment, and a new edition of her 1998 Pomo vampire novel, The Letters of Mina Harker. With Kevin Killian, she co-edited Writers Who Love Too Much, New Narrative, 1977 through 1997. Megan Milks is the author of Margaret and the Mystery of the Missing Body and Slug and Other Stories, both out from Feminist Press this fall, as well as Tori Amos, Bootleg Web Ring, the second installment in Instar's book's new Remember the Internet series. With Marissa Crawford, they co-edited We Are the Babysitters Club essays and artwork from grown-up readers. They live in Brooklyn. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dodie and Megan to the stage. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much again to Sabir and to The Strand. And uh, thanks uh, to everyone who's with us tonight. Um, I'll, spend a I'll send a special thank you to um, Feminist Press and uh, my editor, Lauren Hook, who I think is here. Hi, Lauren. Um, so, um, so we'll both read a bit from our books and then we'll converse. And then, um, yeah, as Sabir said, we'll have some time for our um, audience Q&A at the end. Um, I'm going to read from um, the last story in my book. Um, this is called Patrick Gets Inspired. And um, it was written uh, in response to a solicitation um, from the Evergreen Review um, who invited me to write a coronavirus related porn story um, to go in their COVID-69 series, um, which I really recommend it as like a kind of, um, uh, it's just like a really interesting uh, time capsule to go back to um, this far into the pandemic. So this was written in April and May of 2020. Um, and this is an abridged version. Patrick is in his best position, tied up, pinned down, pillows elevating his head and chest and yearning to breathe quietly, inaudibly, the softest, slightest sighs. But his heaves are graceless, his lungs are stressed, one nostrils plugged up by mucus. Finally, he gives up, breathes through his mouth. What he wouldn't give to breathe easy, silently, clear, to sleep without the obliterative roar of a white noise machine, to cover his wheezes and whistles to enjoy the great pleasure of Zandra sitting on his face without fear, of without fear of suffocation. That last activity is in fact what just happened, minus fearlessness, sucking her clit desperately, noisily, between gulps he managed to get her off. Now he is, as we say, catching his breath. Zandra's face looms over his. She pulls in a full shapely inhale through her nose, exhales forcefully. Outstanding breathing is one of her many talents, steady and reliable, confident and controlled. Patrick covets it. He imagines his lungs filling happily, floating up like bright balloons, pink and glistening. Poor Patrick, he will not be lifting off anytime soon with his wrists and ankles strapped loosely to the bed frame, 
Sandra's short thighs locking him in place. He knows what's coming, a burst he expects of genius. Sandra is working her jaw, sucking her tongue, salivating. Sandra accumulates. She pats him on the chin. Open up, she says with her eyes. He wets his lips, parts them tentatively. She wrenches his jaw open and spits. When I received the email inviting me to write a, corona, to write a coronavirus related porn story, I'm elated. At last, I think, a way I can participate in the public discourse around the virus, a way that plays to my strengths. I create a new file. I start spitballing. First, I try a scene involving two characters rubbing their genitals on a glass barrier. You get that side and I get this side. Then I think phone sex, video sex, latex, a touchless fuck, a spitless kiss, your breath is hot on my cock. Your hazmat suit and my hazmat suit gliding toward each other were cosmonauts. I've been listening to the new Fiona Apple. I imagine a scene in which one character dangles spit over another character who has taken off their plastic face guard to incur risk. Hot or not, I put the shield back on. The shiny comet of drool shivers as it dangles. The character slurps it up and down like a yo-yo. When it drops, it splatters, spreads over the screen, lumpy with bubbles, all these holes. The end, patooey. I go for a walk to think about it, spit droplets, breath, vehicles of contagion, sources of fear. I'm almost to no strand, condensation from my mask fogging up my glasses. When some dude on the street flips his mask down to Hakalubi, I lurch away. Am I rewriting Slug, my first story written in slime? In Slug, a cis straight woman named Patty returns home from a disappointing date and jerks off to a quick succession of improbable erotic fantasies. As she sleeps, a giant slug enters her room and slides on top of her. Patty wakes up, wants it. Slug fucks Patty, coating her in slime, a kind of spit. Patty gets turned. She becomes a giant slug herself. This new story will be a sibling to Slug, I decide, a follow-up, a sequel. I start, I start writing it as Patty for continuity, then think, no, Patty is not Pat Patty anymore. Patty is Patrick. Look how far Patrick has come. He flinches, a delayed response. Xandra's spit is flung through the short distance between them, frothy, a spray, a shower turned on between mouths. Patrick swallows and it goes down his drain. Xandra, she inspires him. He wants to be immersed in her, engulfed, held by her winds, kept in her heart, protected. We need to work on your autonomy, she has said to him more than once. He can't blink the stars from his eyes. RC invites me to participate in an evening of queerotica readings on Google Hangouts. A perfect opportunity, I think, to try out my coronavirus-related porn story. The day rolls up and I have nothing but notes towards scenes, incomprehensible. So I read from Dodie Bellamy's Cunt Norton. I take the tape off your mouth, no dance, and there is only the dance, and we tongue huge globs of spit. The next person reads Sid Nova's How to Fuck from Nerve Endings, the new trans erotic. It's a long, steamy story, and our reader reads the whole thing. As the epic basement scene unfolds, involving yogurt, eggs, a steak knife, I try to determine from the audience's flat expressions who might be getting turned on. I don't know who can see me. People's boxes keep shuffling in my display. The big response this story gets makes me regret my own choice, which offered grotesque word sex without sexiness. I wasn't trying to be sexy, I remind myself, so I can't have failed. Anyway, Dodie's cunt-ups operate beyond mere sexiness. They roar with absurdism, are fantastic, freewheeling, monstrous, intense. At once, they are literary and anti-literary, erotic and not. They are, they are their own erotic. Dodie wins everything. By this logic, I've carried the night. The last person reads from Charles Darwin's The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms with Observations on Their Habits. The worms top us all. Sandra glugs from her glass of water, then resettles around Patrick's hips. Placing three fingers in her mouth, she works them in and out and in circles. Soon her chin is wet with drool. She pulls out a thin ribbon, examines the sticky spangle, slurps it in, pulls it out, keeps producing. Patrick, captivated, can't look away. When Xander's drool is too much for her mouth, she tilts her face over, his frothy bubbles leaking from her lips. Slowly, she lets it spill out of her. It hits the plane of his cheek and creeps toward the seam of his mouth. Xandra mumbles something. She sounds vaguely alarmed. 
When I wrote Slug in 2008, I was trying to woo a crush who had agreed to a writing exchange. I gave it my all. I showed her how weird and how hot I could be. It worked. In her comments, she wrote, Patty should be having sex with me, which never happened, by the way. I suspect this new story will not have that effect. Though my goal was to write something fun and entertainment, a shot of hot levity in a weighty time, I find I'm weighted too. I bike to Prospect Park for a socially distanced walk with A. We park ourselves under a tree and catch up. I ask him about his experiences with spit play and he describes his favorite scenes, pulling his mask off to give me a demo. For a moment, I panic, terrified we're going to get reprimanded, cited for dangling drool. Nothing happens, so I lean in for a better view. I bike home with my mask down and feel free, open, joyously porous and permeable. When I glide past the nursing home where eight bodies were left decomposing, I try not to breathe. Patrick clicks open one eye to see a stream of Xandra's drool. She's swallowing behind her tongue and trying to press close her jaws, but the gush is too strong, a downpour. The mattress is saturated and Patrick is too. He coughs, suddenly panicking. Xandra's drool is suffocating him. It's in his nostrils and in his mouth. It drips down his throat and fills his lungs. Then it stops. Xandra hangs her head down, chest heaving. With every exhale, she seems to grow larger. With every inhale, he shrinks. Soon his hands and feet have slid through their constraints and Xandra is poking him with a silver fingernail. Patrick, her eye peering down at him, is gargantuan. He's never felt so seen. Patrick is no longer Patrick. Patrick is patriculate. We'll call him Patrick for short. Xandra keeps breathing and Patrick keeps shrinking. At last, he catches her breath. Xandra sucks him up and in. Her inhalation drags him into one dark, mysterious nostril. Through her, through her moist, supple throat, some spacious cave to land in a fruity bowl. He's in Xandra's lungs, he realizes, her superior lungs. She keeps giving him new sensations. Then he's sinking, stuck in the lining, pulled through with a pop. Into the heart, he floats. He's made it to her core, here to stay. Let him stay. With a sickening lurch, he's launched outward, flung through the arteries and arterioles to the tissues lining her gut. As soon as he's there, he's released, his molecules rearranged. What a delirious sensation. Xandra is truly amazing. Excuse me. Um, back into the bloodstream, he travels, the flow leading him back to the heart, back to the lungs, a pause. He knows she is holding him inside her. Or preparing him for the inevitable, the appalling, the cold shock of autonomy. Her lungs flatten, he's forced up, and Patrick is expelled. Floating away from Xander's nostril, he catches the pulse of the ceiling fan, gets spun toward the window screen, glides through and into the damp night, which is humid like a new set of lungs. Lorimore Street is dim, thick with dread. He's roaming along it when a, when a gust lifts him up and westward toward the river. Over the water, he hangs, taking in the jagged, moody skyline, the pall. A fresh drift draws him up, up, the city pulling him near. He swoops into it, hovering. He spreads. Okay, I think Dodie's up in here. Hi, all. Uh, well, I'm going to read what Megan requested. So let's hope it goes well. So this is a, a section from the final piece in Bereaved Chase Scene, which is about the death of my husband, Kevin Killian, but it's also about car chase scenes. And uh, it also takes place this section during COVID. So I'll turn these weird lights off after I finish reading. Okay. At Market Street, I turn right and head toward Castro. A gym has moved its machines onto the sidewalk. Friday afternoon, less than a week into our second lockdown, there is only one guy on the gym part of the sidewalk. He's lying on his back, knees and in the air, and he's balancing a tiny barbell on his groin as he thrusts his hips in the air, then back down to the ground, up and down, up and down, and suddenly I'm missing you. I'm sure you'd have an opinion about what was going on here. You who wrote about sex kinks I'd never heard of. Rosary beads up the asshole, pull them out slowly, one by one. What do you think? Is the guy getting off on this barbell groin thing? Or did his trainer put him up to it? Is he pumping up his fucking muscles? Thrust up, thrust down. 
I wonder how long he'll keep going. It's frustrating that I just can't stand and gape, that I have to keep on walking like I have somewhere to go. I see so few 3D humans these days, it's frustrating. I can't pause them, can't rewind, can't even cheer him on. Go, you super fucker, go. I'm reminded of a story about a toddler who had been raised playing on an iPad. And so the child was looking at an image in a print magazine and they placed the tips of their thumb and pointer finger on the picture and spread them wide, then brought them back together and spread them across the picture again, looking confused until the adults in this story realized the child was trying to zoom the magazine image, that they didn't understand that all of life couldn't be zoomed. After a year in isolation, I get it. The rules of the material world seem increasingly tentative. The few times a week I leave the apartment and enter the material world, I seem to glide through it, feet barely touching the ground, head swiveling from side to side. There's little interacting. I'm like a ghost. I'm like you. Do you have any special powers? Can you see into people's hearts? Zap across dimensions? Do you silently flap through the night, your bright wings reflecting the moon, stunning the creatures who scuttle in the forest below? <clears throat> when I return home, my heart opens. This happens frequently, erratically. Imagine a time-lapse film of a bud twirling open into full bloom. My open heart feels floppy. Gladly, it would brush against anything, anybody. When I told Peter Gizzi that grieving had been good for his writing, he said it gave him a soul. Why did you have to go? It's intolerable, you left, and with such a brutal end. Most lung cancer victims, I read somewhere, die not of lung cancer, but of infections or reactions to chemo. I was eager to take on your dying, to totally devote myself to your sickness. It's as if this hidden cave in my psyche opened and out flew a swarm of bats wearing little nurses caps. No decision was involved. My drive to care for you was instinctual as those monarch butterflies. We saw that one Thanksgiving day in Santa Cruz, which traveled vast distances to roost in those specific trees, their branches all a flutter the limbs of an Ovidian god beast. My urge to care repelled you, you who were about extracting the last dregs from life, who were ravenous to live and live and live, hobbling and racing around with the cane Kaiser gave you because of all the blood thinners. If you fell down, it would have been disastrous. You didn't give a fuck about my research into chemo side effects. The bag of quick dissolving mints I bought that are supposed to help with nausea, you wouldn't touch them. When we first met, your stories and memoirs about your self-destructive youth terrified me. Though I love the writing, your past felt surreal, like nobody was behind the wheel and you were careening. Everybody who knew you when you were young agrees, and you affirm this yourself repeatedly, that I saved your life that you would have been dead long ago without me. The chase scene has begun. You sit upright on the edge of the couch, your attention absolutely fixed on the TV. None of that messy here and there, in and out, past and present. You are right here, right now, watching with the focused precision of a laser sight on a Smith & Weston, registering waves of awe, terror, delight. Your face fragments and coalesces like a claymation character, a series of ever moving parts that twitch and bulge, revealing emotion. Grunts, gas, laughter, inrush and outrush of excited breathing. As the world rushes in through your eyes and ears, our living room becomes the cab of the car. You're buckled in, careening into a dangerous future. Your hospital room was so packed with visitors I had to leave. Your friends were po possessive. And at the end, when I put my foot down, no, this is about family now, it was a battle. 
Some people couldn't conceive there could be a private Kevin space they couldn't access. So fully you seem to have given yourself to them. You would have been a better widow than I. You'd suffer bravely and sentimentally far and wide. Your widowhood would inspire people, bring them together. You would convince even those who hated me in life that in death I was a saint. And then the masses ravenous for the kindness and generosity you perfected over the 33 years I was married to you, from quirky, unrelatable drunk to charismatic daddy you arose, capable of melting the hardest of hearts could absorb you. You knew to revere the dead. You wrote that finding where Spicer was buried satisfied, quote, a huge longing in my own heart because as I hope you have seen, for a man like me, there's no closure unless I go to the grave and fall down on it as I did to John Ford's grave in Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City and embrace spectral memory as a living thing in my arms. On the bathroom wall hangs the snapshot you took of Franco Harris grave that one time we were visiting your parents in Smithtown and took a trip to the Green River Cemetery in Springs, grace to be born and live as variously as possible. Online, I look at photos of O'Hara's funeral, July 27th, 1966. Allen Ginsberg on a dirt path, head cast down, arm around the shoulders of Kenneth Koch, women in flats and low heels, one wearing an era iconic paisley sheath, handsome Bill Berkson in a suit. I read about the violent eulogy full of raw fury delivered by O'Hara's sometime lover, Larry Rivers, in which he describes O'Hara's destroyed body in graphic detail. Mourners groaned and yelled, stop, stop. O'Hara's mother gasped. The text of the eulogy is almost impossible to find. I Googled and Googled and Googled, and finally in a YouTube video, artist Skylar Fain reads it. Here's my notes. His skin was purple where it showed through the white gown. His body was a quarter larger than usual, sewing every few inches, some stitches straight, three or four inches long, some stitches semicircular and longer. Eyes receded into head, lids black, quip gas of breath, whole body quivered, tube and nostrils. He looked like a shaped wound, leg bone broken, splintered, piercing the skin, every rib cracked, a third of his liver wiped out. Rivers, what good can talking about it do? I don't know. To my widow self, this is poetry. The bereaved clings to all the tender details of dying. When you've seen the unseeable, there's no easy return. Nothing else makes sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was that was really wonderful. Um, that last essay is so uh, devastating and um, and exquisite. Yeah, at the same time. Um, okay, so. So Dodi, you've been such a huge influence on my writing for so many years, basically since Andrea Lawler introduced me to it in 2005. Um, and uh, part of the reason I read, I wanted to read Patrick Gets Inspired is because I, I think you can really hear the influence of, of your work in that story. Um, and um, yeah, it's been just such a dream getting to know you over these past few years. Um, just to catch people up, um, I, uh, I have been getting to know Dodi over the last few years and part through working on this, um, this uh, long form profile of her that ended up going in um, the Dodi Bellamy is on her mind um, book um, that sort of, you know, like um, uh, solidified that, that year long project that the Wattis Institute put on. And through that project of working on this profile, um, I was, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to 
just like really um, get into diving back into Dodie's body of work. Um, I spent a lot of time at the um, Beinecke looking through um, Dodie's and Kevin's um, archives. And um, I got to spend some days in San Francisco with Dodie. Yeah, the, um, and, a lot is paid for Megan to just fly from New York out to San Francisco. I know. Was, to hang out with me. That's, yeah. <laughs> it was so great. It was, yeah, <laughs> nothing like that is ever, has ever happened or will happen to me again. Um, so yeah, it was really just wonderful. And um, that project came into my life at like a really crucial moment. Um, for reasons I won't go into, it was just like really important for me to kind of like uh, return to my roots in queer and feminist experimental writing. Um, so it was very important me, to me for that reason. And then, um, and then we've developed this um, wonderful friendship on top of that, which has been um, so uh, just exciting and, and wonderful. Um, so I wanted to open here with friendship just because um, it's kind of a way to start with where Leslie Jameson ends in, in her recent New Yorker profile of, of you. From no, last but I do week. have to say one okay. thing that's really okay. ironic. Okay. When, uh, Anthony Huberman hired Megan to write this profile on me. He, he said for to write a New Yorker type profile. Oh. And so then it's really funny that the New Yorker Review comes out and quotes Megan's New Yorker profile. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> but it was yeah. But I, yeah. I also I just wanted to say I did not know that you were really into my writing uh, when I suggested that you would be the person to write the profile. But it was because uh, we went to, Kevin and I, I think it was the MLA was in Los Angeles and we went to the trans reading and I saw you read and that's kind of what caused me to, you know, it was like an incredible evening anyway. But that, that's like why I was interested that this, like the fact that oh, you may have had any connection to my work, I did not know. You know. Oh, I didn't. I oh, thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that <laughs> either. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that was a very memorable evening because uh, we were graced with Warren Beatty and Annette Benning's presence. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. No, um, we were going to leave at the break, but when they showed up, there you couldn't have gotten Kevin out of there with a bulldozer. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, Okay, well, returning to my carefully constructed opening question. Um, I, I, yeah, I wanted to start with friendship and intimacy just because of where uh, Leslie Jameson ends up. Um, the way in which your work, as she writes, quote, seeks the intimate texture of conversation. Um, and I think just connection, I feel like your work really always just seeks to connect. Um, there is a tremendous warmth I find an irresistible charisma in your writing. And um, yeah, I think an invitation to intimacy. And I think, you know, Chastine is, is doing that with like a, you know, with the epistolary mode, you know, we can talk about that more. Um, but I guess just to start off, can you talk a bit about how you think about and cultivate intimacy in your, in your writing? Uh, I, don't, I don't think that I cultivate it. You know what I mean? I, I take notes on things and for ages before I put anything into the computer and then I, I start constructing it. But I very much feel that intimacy is a tone in writing. I don't think mm -hmm. intimacy is like uh, a revealing of the self as much as a tone that a, where you appear to be revealing the self. Mm -hmm. But of course, then certain things are revealed, but it's I know sometimes it thinks if things are personal, somehow it seemed like you're not obsessively in control, but I am obsessively in control of mm -hmm. the writing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I don't, I know I've had that project of, of writing really personally since I started writing. And so I don't think it was like a decision to move in that direction. It was just a direction that I was always interested in and you know I don't and I don't feel at least that writing about the self is really all that different than writing about the rest of the world it's just, it's just there's all the for me it's just there's all these details that are offered up to me about okay. myself but uh, so I try to like kind of blur the that boundary between between the self and the world and and when I write about myself I try to bring lots of the 
rest of the world that I'm embedded in into it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm also thinking about this quote um, that comes up not in chasing, but in um, the violence of the image. That the, yeah, I think that's the right title. Mm -hmm. This quote about love um, that um, I'll just quote it. Every piece I've ever written has centered around love, no matter how fucked up its manifestation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you relate to that yourself in your writing? Oh, I want to hear more about you. Well, that's not fair. Uh, well, yeah, I think, you know, when, when I talk about that, obviously, I, I write a lot about love of other people. But I think that it's also about love of the world. And, and, and the one thing that writing does is it really opens your heart to the world, right? All those coincidences that writers are constantly talking about happening wouldn't happen if somehow the, your vision and your heart wasn't somehow expanded. Do you get? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like for me, um, fiction especially serves like, yeah, kind of like reparative. Um, uh, it's like a, a tool for repair in some way, or just like a way to move from a position of like, you know, um, um, a position of, I don't know, like problems with other people um, and a way to kind of like work through those problems and, and come to a position of like, uh, I don't know, like love, I guess is one way to put it. Um, just like working over again and again in, in fiction and kind of, uh, yeah, making, in some ways making a mess of it and in some ways, um, that's funny uh, mess of it with what you just read right <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but yeah so i'm curious i i was struck by looking at slug and the patrick piece and how at the end it was sort of like you know the patrick piece is much more realistic than slug there's no giant slug that the person is having sex with but then at the end Patrick dissolves into this like fantasy space. So, and, and as the, at the end where uh, Patty, right, uh, becomes a slug at the end of slug. So both of them, there's this total body transformation. And was that like something you had intended for the Patrick piece or could you just not control yourself? <laughs> um. Gosh, let me think back to the writing process of that. Uh, you know, um, I think part of the, the way I got to that uh, ending was because I was challenged by Jean Thornton in our writing group to just be like, you know, this could get much weirder. And because um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jean and um, Max, who is also in, in the group, uh, I read, you know, an early draft of that, actually several early drafts of it. So, so I'm indebted to Jean for that. Um, and then I also, you know, yeah, I think um, that scene in the end where um, Patrick gets inhaled basically was um, inspired in part by um, like a very quick moment in um, your, this excerpt from your book, um, Sex Space, or like what had at that time been called Sex Space, sure. Sex Space which hasn't been published yet, but where um, Carla is um, imagining all of these little I think uh, like little worm cocks like running through her body, like through her veins or something. It's just like a small moment, but I was just so, so struck by that. But I um, think in the letters of Mina Harker, or mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, who knows, but someplace in my writing, there's this whole part where the guy goes into her body and, and swirls around and, and then shoots out through her tits, you know, her nipples. And, and it was, <laughs> it was based on that movie, The Fantastic Voyage. Did you? Oh, yeah that yeah. I, I saw as a kid so it reminded me you know both of wherever this was where I wrote it and mm -hmm. that movie mm -hmm. yeah yeah I've uh I've yeah I've also seen the fantastic voyage um there's a section of my novel where um characters like um travel around in this giant mutant body um and that's definitely <laughs> indebted to the fantastic voyage um as well um 
yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Mm. Mm. Well, speaking of Mina, um, the end of the, so there's like a lot of um, uh, a lot of clear parallels um, between Mina, the letters of Mina Harker, which for those who don't know, just got republished um, uh, alongside Bereaved um, uh, and Chase Scene. Um, you know, there's like both are written in a in an epistolary mode. Um, both use persona. Um, did you have Mina in mind as you were writing Chase Scene? I think I did not so much at first. Well, actually, Chase Scene was supposed to be two separate pieces. First, uh, I was going to write the Chase Scene, you know, based on my online research about Chase Scenes and movies. And some people have criticized me for the, t the Chase Scenes that I talk about are very narrow, as if I don't understand that there are more Chase Scenes in the world. But hello, it's editing. But anyway, uh, so anyway, I, I was going to do this Chase Scene piece. And I was going to, it was like Easter or something. And I was just going to write like a short, or maybe it was Thanksgiving. I was just going to write a short letter to Kevin and then move on. But the letter to Kevin kept getting longer and longer and longer. And it became clear it was a piece. And then I got the brilliant idea that I could just put all the chase scene stuff in the letter to Kevin and, and make it one piece. So, uh, so, but as I worked on it, then the obvious parallels to that it's a letter uh, to me and, and there's Kevin and I, you know, were friends for a long time before it became like we got involved in any way. And, and neither of us, I had ever, I think, considered it as a possibility for a long, you know what I mean? It wasn't like love at first sight or anything. But uh, so we, Mina originally was writing letters to friends and people I would meet, like inappropriate letters, and they would write back. And so a big part of like kind of moving from friendship to some kind of energy between us was Kevin writing to Mina. And, and pretty much most of that isn't in the novel, but, but those letters still exist. And I think you looked at some when you went to the Beinecke that the originals are, are there. So, so the, that kind of intimacy of letter writing was really important in our relationship. So so yeah, as I worked on it, then I started making little tie-ins, but I didn't want to do a lot of it, you know, just, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But in terms of bereaved as a, as a kind of constructed persona, how do you see like bereaved and Mina as a construction? Well, again, I didn't think about it when I came up with bereaved, you know, I, I the mm -hmm. first, you know, there's three bereaved pieces in the, and you know the first one is really alienated. Kevin is just called the other one, and then the second one is in third person, but at least Kevin gets named. And then and then the chase scene at the end is like a huge step into intimacy and kind of admitting that there was a loss rather than uh just this sort of constipated anger that i i was in so uh i'm i'm having a problem megan because i'm not remembering your question like oh oh i was okay, okay. I, I remember, okay. I remember. <laughs> uh, uh so uh so anyway the only way that i i wanted to write you know i had this gig to write this catalog essay on christina ramberg for the kw in berlin and and they just wanted, they don't want me to write about the art. They just wanted me to write a piece of experimental fiction that tapped into the psychology of the art. And, mm -hmm. and so it had only been a couple months at the most since Kevin died. And I don't know, that project was so compelling to get paid money to do that. Hello. You know, I just couldn't resist it. You know, it was just so compelling. And so the only way that I could do it was to really mediate the experience. So, uh, you know, bereaved is you know, as I've said before, like it's based on when I went to Los Angeles, you know, like maybe three weeks after he died and 
my friend Matthias, who I was staying with, kept calling me the bereaved over and over again, the bereaved in this really cartoony way. And, and it really, really was good for me, you know what I mean? You know, to just like laugh at my situation, even though it really wasn't a laughable situation, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of where I got the, the name from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, okay, we need to talk. They're gonna do audience Q and A and you've said hardly anything about yourself. So what do we <laughs> do? I don't know that that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it isn't. Uh, Oh, and also I, I re looked at Trauma Rama because you had suggested that. And that's also like that kind of, it's like the site that you're supposedly reporting on, but then you say at the beginning, you make up stories. So that I think one of the things that's interesting about your Trauma Rama piece is that it's impossible to tell what actually was there and what you made up. And so what, what's that about for you? That blurring between you know mm -hmm. like the re you know, the reader's totally destabilized right because they don't know what's real what isn't real mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been a while since i've looked at that uh piece that yeah too, it was is that too abstract no no i actually was hoping that we would talk about um yeah fiction in relation to nonfiction because um you do a lot of you bring a lot of like fantasy and speculation into your nonfiction in ways that are really exciting. Um, and uh, that like, for me, like open up a lot of possibility in nonfiction um, that previously I had only sort of experienced um, in fiction. Um, but yeah, yeah, Trauma Rama is interesting. Um, I think of it as mostly I don't know. I think of it as a creative nonfiction piece, but I guess because there's like editorializing, it's um, that's not like technically accurate. Um, but the uh, fact that it's like it's like people are reporting on supposedly like sexual situations that are physically impossible. It seems to really connect with the, the other two pieces, right? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, Trauma Rama is. Um, is a is riffing off of the 17 or yeah it's the 17 magazine um column trauma rama where uh readers write in with their most humiliating embarrassing experiences um and you know i just had an interesting conversation with um carly moore um who also you know has um a book out on feminist press and one forthcoming um and she happened to do a dissertation on um Carly here. I think so. Um, on uh, 17, that uh, and, and an article on Trauma Rama. And she said she tried really hard to um, get in touch with, or she tried in really hard to get the editors to tell her um, how much of the Trauma Ramas were like made up or you know written or rewritten by the editors and they just wouldn't say because uh, they're also like uniform right and, and sort of and they're so um constructed and they all have the same tone so um it seems uh it seems likely that they're probably all just written by the editors um but in any case so this project involved um me uh inviting um friends of mine people in my community to share their trauma ramas with me and to kind of like redefine or or um you know th through through whatever anecdotes they decided to share with me i was hoping that we would redefine then what what the trauma rama could be make Got space it. for like queer experience and and um other kinds of trauma um outside of just like getting your period um in front of your crush um so <laughs> and then yeah it was a really interesting exploration for me and like yeah just like what people wanted to share and what and also what people just like did not want to share um so i learned a lot through that project and through lots of conversations with with people mm -hmm. yeah. wow uh, let's see our first audience question is a softball to start us off, and it's from Lena, who asks, what is your favorite thing about the other's writing? And so why don't we go 
Well, I think you've spoken a bit to it, but so why don't we start off with you, Megan, and then we'll go Dodie after. Mm, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I can reiterate the thing, some of the things I've already said. Um, uh, I, I just think, uh, Dodie, your work um, is just so, I just love like the risks it takes um, with form and with content. And, um, and I just feel like every piece of yours um, is just kind of like adding something new to, um, to um, well, I wanna say, I, I wanna make genre categorizations, but I also don't at all. But um, yeah, I feel like every piece you write is just like doing something new that is always very interesting. And um, yeah, I'm, and I'm always here from it. Always here for it. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> okay. So, well, I think uh, one of the things that really has intrigued me about your work is like kind of basically doing sex outside of genre categories, right? Like, mm. like a kind of a radical sexuality that goes just kind of blows up the whole concept of binaries and opens into another world, or, or you know, just like it's not like trying it's creating a kind of a, a whole new sexuality mm. that uh, I find really interesting. And, uh, oh, and you, you know, the staginess of it all. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I find that really interesting. Uh, and, and, you know, and of course I'm interested in, in that, that kind of moving in my own work in that kind mm. of moving between fantasy and reality and, and blurring them. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then our next question is from Zaki, who says, who asks, how do you envision the body operating in your works? For you, Dodi, I mean, the sort of polyphonic quality your characters have, and for you, Megan, I mean, your general fixation, which that would be from Zach. <laughs> and My general us... fixation? On oh, with body? bodies? Oh, okay. Yes, but do <laughs> let us know if that is an accurate summary. Wait, can you read that again? Or is yeah, that, that was, a, that was a, these are kind of, are, don't you just want to ask us if we use a typewriter or a computer? <laughs> or <something like> that? <laughs> well, that is not the audience who showed up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah so, if you could read it again it would be helpful because it's it's very long i should take notes so zaki asks how do you envision the body operating in your works for you jody i mean the polyphonic quality your characters have and for you megan i mean your general fixation on it uh, okay <laughs> hmm. well I think when I was younger, like one of the big questions was like wanting to write about sex and, and wanting to write about the body. And then like, how does that translate into the abstraction of language? Like it, it's sort of like these, you know, that Lady Hawk movie that I like so much in Nina, like these two beings are in different dimensions and how do they come together? And uh, so I guess, you know, one uh obvious thing was like we started thinking about porn because porn acts on the body and uh and then horror i was very interested in horror because horror acts on the body and then even like romance acts on the body so that i think that actually the more you think about it that you can become like the writer becomes like a uh almost a conductor of the reader's body, right? You can't bring your own body into it, but you can you can impact other bodies through the writing of it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Go on, Megan. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I am I am generally fixated <laughs> on the body as it as it um, operates in my in my work. Uh, but yeah, I think um, I don't know. I think uh, I think I'm always interested in uh, making space for uh, reimagined bodies and um, like really using um, what fiction um, 
makes available in terms of like a space of fantasy, right? Like I really, I think in my fiction, um, I am really harnessing fantasy as like a, as um, <sighs> harnessing fantasy. I feel like I've lost the, the, the sentence I was trying to make. Um, but yeah, yeah, fantasy is really important in my fiction is, is a visible way to say that. And um, so in some of my, I'm just thinking of like a piece like Swamp Cycle, um, a story in Slug, um, that is a story in which the body just gets like reconfigured and like, um, and um, like the character, it's a very abstract story. It's like probably the most abstract story um, I've written, but um, the character, the protagonist who's unnamed um, is, um, is like asking for things from this swamp and the swamp is giving them things. And one of the things the character wants is, um, is um, I can't even explain this story. It's like such a weird story, but um, <laughs> anyway, like there's a baby that there's a baby that shows up, but the baby, um, is made like not through like the sexual reproductive system, but through the digestive system. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just sort of like trying to get out of like, um, I don't know, just trying to like remake the body uh, outside of gender and sex and things like that. Um, uh, so that's always something that I'm trying to play with. Not always, but it's something I have played with in some stories. Lots of different experiments. And you've been really influenced by genre fiction a lot in, in your desire and to do this and, right? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I loved what you, how you, uh, how you were describing the, those like sort of para, para literary genres. Um, yeah, porn has been really, um, you know, influential sci-fi and fantasy, speculative fiction. Um, horror as well. Yeah, I, I also have been very influenced um, uh, by horror. Mm -hmm. well, this actually segues nicely into our next question, which is any tips on good sex writing from Lauren? <laughs> and so I think we can approach that as a craft question. And maybe uh, yeah. we can start off with you, Megan, for that one. Oh, gosh. Um, tips for good how to how to do good sex writing um i yeah i don't know i mean i think <laughs> and people have very specific ideas of what good sex writing is that i just don't agree with um to be honest like some people are like really against what they call prurience prurience i can't even say that word in um like you know like literary writing and i'm just like all for <laughs> prurient writing um yeah so I don't know I think I really yeah I think there is like a, a conversation about aesthetics that we can have that maybe we don't have time for but um I don't know just go yeah uh, I think whatever seems hot to you it will be hot to some other readers but not everyone I don't know Dodie what do you think well uh I say like pay attention to your experience and try to and don't use cliches. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, and yeah, and don't look, forget about porn while you're doing it unless you're like doing porn. You know what I mean? Mm. The, I don't know. I, I haven't really written sex writing in a while, but I'm going back to this abandoned novel that is a sex novel so it's kind of so I would but most of that's already written it'll be more like editing it the mm. sex part so yeah and I know I know Melissa Phoebos has a book coming out that is I think a lot about sex writing and writing the body um, I forget what it's called but that should be really interesting yeah I think it's body work it's out oh, okay. soon yeah but mm. to sort of riff off of that question with one of my own it was somewhat curious about the fact that you both reference porn as an influence, which isn't something I've ever heard at an author event before. So I was curious how porn became a site of literary influence. I don't think porn influenced me, like watching porn and then I didn't watch porn and, and write about it. I guess 
maybe I have at some point, but in general, it wasn't. But I think it was just being like trained to write by a gay man. Porn was very important. And, you know, and then how porn changed when AIDS happened to, you know, include safe sex. So like porn, you know, from the feminist, you know, Andrea Dworkin era, which somehow is back. Uh, you know, porn was just like this evil thing that no feminist would like ever look at. And then these gay men like porn is good, porn is great, you know, and and mm -hmm. being an expression, of, you know, of sexuality. So I think I was kind of more influenced by reading, a, you know, stuff like Linda Williams, that's her name, right? And uh, reading about porn and, and I guess, you know, Bataille, we were mm -hmm. very big into Bat Bataille and that crazy story of the eye. And, you know, yeah. like, so how porn can kind of bleed into other genres. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does yeah. that answer? I, I, I don't really have much to say about it, you know. Oh, no, that was a good answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, yeah, like, I, I also was... Um, trained by a gay man um <laughs> I, <laughs> I love that phrase <laughs> but, they ruined uh, us they ruined <laughs> us but yeah um one of my teachers was samuel r delaney chip and so yeah um, oh god <laughs> yeah. yeah uh who has yeah published he, yeah, like, he's some very important. pornographic stuff no no but yeah he's mm -hmm. important to me the way he like pushed like madman mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like just the way he pushed things yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, in addition to that, like, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of very interesting, like, uh, very wild, imaginative porn. And that's like, that's the kind of porn that I feel like is inspiring, you know, just like the way that fantasy shows up and like the way that people um, explore fantasies um, through porn, I feel like is, um, is, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, like, yeah inspiring i guess i'll use that word again it, it, it's interesting when you put it in the framework of like fantasies and what people are exploring and how that then translates into sort of like fiction that connects to what you were saying about the body earlier mm -hmm. and then also should just kind of note it was very influential to like know people who were making porn you know and kind of get a sense of the lifestyle and 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 you know what i mean like kind of the relationship to the body through that, you know. Yeah. And then our final question of the evening is what's next? Sorry, I'm going to rephrase this one. What are you looking forward to reading next? And this one's from Linda. Oh, well, I actually just ordered uh, Bertha Harris's Lover, mm. which I read back when it came out, and but I've been reading about since. So I think that's the, I'm looking forward to reading Bertha Harris now as an adult and seeing how my relationship to that book has changed. Mm. Uh, yeah, I've been meaning to track a copy of her work down to, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned her to me last time we talked. Um, let's see. Um, I'm very excited to read Lily Huang's new book, um, Underneath, um, which I just got a copy of. And I'm just looking at my stack over here. Uh, oh, Gabrielle da Daniels. Um, sure. Uh, there's a new uh, collection of um, Gabrielle Daniels' work uh, out from, what is it called? Dog, Dog Park Collective? Yeah, she was someone who's associated with the new narrative. I mean, Jody knows more than. You know, I'm so glad that happened because that book was published in the UK, which made it very, very difficult and expensive to get. So that um, mm -hmm. it's now published here. So yeah, Gabrielle's a fantastic writer. You all should buy that book. Thank you. At the very least, that's two for my list. Because like Lily Wong, I didn't know she had a new book coming out. I love the bestiary. And yeah, Gabrielle yeah. Daniels, I will look up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, the fanning about books aside, thank you both <laughs> so much. That was such a fantastic and interesting discussion. 
to our audience. Thank you for joining us this evening. If you haven't already purchased a copy of Bereaved or Slug and Other Stories, I've dropped links in the chat and they will come with signed book plates because both Megan and Dodie were kind enough to sign uh, book plates for us. And mine are still en route to New York, but I did I did mail them, so they're they will be there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and okay. that would have come in an email to you, but to uh, anyone who orders a copy of the read, just know we'll be mailing the book plate separately. And on that okay. note, yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks to Beer. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.